Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. Michael Phillips, Richmond Times Dispatch with us. Miguel, what a week. What a week. What a week. What a day. What a week. Uh, what, a, what a month it's going to be. Uh, you just feel it in the air. It's, it's, it's not just the pollen. It's also oh, the excitement. That it's, 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 it's the Josh Harris in the air. Yes. Um, it is kind of a weird thing because in a way it's anticlimactic because we've been slow rolling towards this. Like this collision has been like, oh, we're going to hit. Oh, we're going to hit. Boom. And that, and that yesterday was the boom. It's like, oh, wow, we hit. We hit. We did it. We did it. But it, when, you, when you heard the news, whether it was you know, seeing Sportico's tweet or whatever confirmation work you did, like as someone who's covered this team for a long time, like what, what is your reaction now that the Dan Snyder era is essentially over? Yeah, I mean, you think about moments along the way, and and you know, one of them was when they, and this was, uh, gosh, we're two, two, two and a half years ago now. The Adam Schefter statement, they're going to review the name. Um, that was what was like, whoa, like that's a big, big moment. Um, it, you know, th- these are moments leading up to this. Like that one was a jaw dropper for me. I didn't think he'd ever change the name. Him changing the name tells me everything's on the table from there. Uh, November, the Forbes report, he's considering selling the team. I mean, you assume you know where that's going to go, but there's still skepticism. And then probably about January, I had made peace with he's going to sell the team. It's going to happen. You, you knew that from talking to people. We all got the, we all understood he was going to sell the team. Um, the Bezos news was probably the biggest news of the week for me uh, because we, we couldn't read Bezos. Um, you know, there were, there was no, um, I, I was unaware of anybody who had an inside line to Bezos, and if they were, they certainly weren't reporting it out. Uh, he was a mystery the, the whole way, uh, all, all the way until he bailed uh, earlier this week. And so once he bailed, uh, I mean, I think we knew there was one group left. It was a matter of accepting that offer. And, and look, we're, we're in the semantics here of it's a non-exclusive offer. Somebody please show up with more money. But it, but it's done. It's going to be these guys. Uh, it's going to happen, you know, ideally mid-May. Um I can tell you this, a, a lot of people over the years have said to me, wow, you know, Dan Snyder must be really good for business. You've always got something to talk about. Um, and as you know, that is not true at all. Uh, the oh, very awful. best thing for business, Craig, would be you and me at a Super Bowl talking about the team we cover participating in that game. Um, you'd see the crowds every Sunday. They're, they're sparse. Um, we've got to get those crowds back. Got to get the winning back. That is what's good for business, and and so I, I think we all mutually celebrate this as an opportunity to move closer to that goal. That is one hundred percent. Like, who is having a better time, the sports editor uh, of the paper in Kansas City, uh, or or you? Who's having the better time, uh, my my good friends uh, at Six Ten Sports in Kansas City, or or us? I I'd rather be them. That's for sure. They've got Patrick Mahomes and Mahomes and Super Bowl trophies. When you walk into a locker room to conduct interviews, you can tell within 30 seconds, even if you've never been there before, whether that team is winning or losing. Everything just, everything's better. Everybody's more friendly. Everybody's more open to telling you their stories. The stories are better. Why are there so many, so many better stories about guys on winning teams? Because, because they're cool with it. Like they're willing to spend the time with you and tell those stories because they won't be, oh my gosh, how could you tell this story? He needs to be watching more film. Uh, you know, it's, it's better for everybody when there's winning. Michael Phillips, Richmond Times Dispatch with us here on the Team 980. This is, of course, the Hoffman Show. All right, uh, let's go through some some timeline stuff because you've been around for a lot of it, especially the latter half um, covering the team. Like, when to you did it really change? And by change, I mean the stadium stopped being full. Um, the, the vitriol towards the team turned up and the apathy of it like eventually it was vitriol first and then it was apathy like when when did those three things happen when did it turn from like oh this is annoying to vitriol when did the vitriol turn to apathy and then at what point in that process did the stadium start to empty out the way you remember it yeah and and, you know you so Vinny serato was was the gm for the first decade and then bruce allen comes in for the second decade and we we i think probably bought more than we should have ah Dan has learned his lessons. Things will be good now. They draft RG3. They draft Robert. And, I mean, let's high point it here. 
they beat the Dallas Cowboys to make the playoffs at the end of the 2012 season, that is your high point. That, I mean, that, that everybody left that stadium that night thinking, whew, he's got it. It took a decade. This was a, it was a rough decade, but he milked us as human ATMs for a decade, and I didn't appreciate that, and I didn't appreciate the losing. But we've got it. We're there. I'm excited. I'm on board with this. And then when that unraveled over the next year, yeah, you know, you, you bounce back with, and here's Kirk Cousins, and here's this, you know, the, the saviors they trotted out were progressively less impressive. Um, and, and so that was You could argue Kirk impact. was actually the high point. Sure, from, from an actual football standpoint. From a fan standpoint, it was Robert because they believed. They believed sure. that this oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. was finally pointed in the right direction. And then when they realized it wasn't, it was, all right, I'm done believing this guy. He's cried wolf too many times. I'm waiting for this thing to turn around. And it just never did, and it just never did. Uh, and then obviously your, your moments you're pointing to are uh, the New York Times had the cheerleader story, the Washington Post had, of course, the story from inside the building. Uh, and then equally important, uh, you start COVID and Dan angers the minority shareholders, uh, the three guys who owned you know, the 40% of the team, and they turn on him. And I think that's your big, like, that was the point of no return when three powerful billionaires decided they didn't like him and they needed revenge on him. At that point, you had the FedEx statement. Uh, you had the, the brokered negotiation with the league. Um, at that point, we had hit the point of no return. We didn't know when this day would come, but we knew we were flying towards it. Yeah, definitely. The, a moment that I'll never forget is the what turned out to be the last game before the pandemic, um, the 2019 Eagles game, end of the season. And I actually I left the press box for a little bit to go say hi to a friend, and they happened to be sitting in like the suite section in like the 300, so I was decently high up, and they were in the end zone, so I had like a nice view straight forward of the stadium. And I remember realizing at that point, because you can like the press box is low enough that you can't really see a lot. And it's at this like it's in a corner. So there's only so much of the actual stadium you can see and leaving the press box and having that vantage point of a full field view of 85 to 90 percent green jerseys. I was like, whoa, like this at that point, I knew Bruce Allen was getting fired, you know, the next week. Like that was that point that was done. Um, to think that that would also eventually kind of lead in a way to where we are too, because you've been covering the stadium as closely as anybody. And and I think that that's going to be obviously the next big project for Harris. But like, you know, I I was actually just a couple hours ago, I popped in one of the Twitter spaces that the fans are doing. I was like, people need to understand the reports uh, and the investigations mattered. The, you know, the season ticket sales stuff mattered. The, everything mattered like different owners that were willing to eventually push him out. If it came to that, obviously we're now at a point where it didn't, but all those different things eventually added up to him, not really having a choice, but to sell if he wanted to at least make money off of him getting essentially kicked out of the league. You've got so many alternate realities where he still owns the team today uh, or still owns the team after this transaction closes. Uh, One, he, he, he gets the stadium deal done in Virginia, which was really close, um, you know, much closer than people realize. If he gets a stadium deal done, the other owners aren't kicking him out, um, you know, and he gets that revenue stream and he can maybe pay back the loan. Number two is he doesn't alienate the minority owners, obviously. Um, you know, you just you look back along the way. And I think number three, and I don't say this flippantly, but I just say this. I think if he had dug his heels in on the name and made it an us versus them, uh, he could have just become an Al Davis-like character. And, 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 you know, not to say that any of this would be better by any stretch, um, but I think that might have staved off the inevitable. Um, that, I, I that's interesting, though, them. because I do think he would have lost a lot of money. Like, I, I think the Nike and the FedEx stuff was real. And at mm-hmm. that point, for a guy who's already in financial trouble, like, he'd be cutting off his nose to spite his face and then be like, well, cool, I'm the Pharaoh. <laughs> He would have absolutely, like, you talk about dying on the hill. He would be dead on the hill. Um, but, you know, for the NFL, who, who tiptoed so, you know, so much tiptoeing through the Trump years, I, would they have risked making that a big issue, you know, a big mm. deal? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if they would have or not. I, I think they would have treaded very lightly around it, though. 
I'm glad we didn't have to do that because I would have gotten Ooh, myself yeah. fired. Uh, Michael Phillips <laughs> is with us here on the Team 980. All right, so that gets us to, to Josh Harris. Um, I made the argument yesterday that the practice facility is actually a more pressing project than the stadium. I don't know if it's more important um, because of the grandiose nature of what is going to it's going to take to do this stadium, especially if it's in DC, the political capital it's going to take. Uh, nevertheless, the financial capital, like we're talking about a two to $5 billion project versus what could be a three or $400 million project in redoing the practice facility probably. Um, but I do think like from a competitive standpoint, getting a new practice facility should be the number one thing or completely revamping the practice facility should be the number one to item on Josh Harris's to-do list. Agree or disagree? Yeah, I'll disagree. I think one domino has to fall before the other. And I think you got to figure out, are you going to do it all in one place? Or are you going to do it piecemeal like, like the Cowboys do it with, with the stadium and the star and, and Frisco and all that? And uh, what are you going to do with Landover? What are you going to do with Ashburn? I think the Ashburn land's probably so valuable uh, that, that you sell it. Um, and, you know, that that's an immediate return on your investment there. Um, do you want to build a practice facility in Landover? Do you, is there, you know, like they've got their little sports book there. I don't think that's moving the needle in a tangible way. Um, you know, I, I think you're probably pressing to get the whole thing together. Now, there's ways to do it quickly where, you know, before the stadium opens, you can open the facility in that space while construction's ongoing. I think there's going to be obviously a surge of excitement. There is a surge of excitement right now. There will be a good crowd week one. There will be a lot of, you know, cheering and, and people fired up. There's going to be a lull after that because, uh, you know, I'm just, let's just put this out there, Craig. This isn't a Super Bowl roster, and this isn't a Super Bowl head coach, and they're not going to make the Super Bowl this year. Um, and they might not you next year. You don't know either. that, Michael. Okay, you know that. You <laughs> I, know that. It's fine. This you know. clip will be brought back to haunt me uh, when we are uh, in <laughs> Vegas next year uh, on Radio Row. Um, it, there's going to be a lull at some point. And um, I think, you know, you look at what the Rams did when they moved to L.A. They built the team towards – we're hosting the Super Bowl in 20, you know, in was it 21, uh, 22, whenever that was, the Super Bowl in L.A., and they won that Super Bowl. That was what they were building their roster to. I think you build this team with an eye towards 28. This this isn't a Walton situation, you know, throwing the money at Russell Wilson, Sean Payton, we got to win now. This isn't a Tepper situation. Oh, my gosh, I paid so much money, I have to win. Give me my wins now. This is a group that will see the long game here. I think you're building towards 28. You open the new stadium with a competitive team. You make your case. Here we are. Come root for us. We're back. So you and I are on the same page on another element of potential things to happen in 2028, because I saw your tweet yesterday about it, uh, which is that if you want to rebrand, that is the time to do it. Um, Kime was saying also that a team that rebrands apparently has to wait five years to do it again, um, which does complicate things because what happens if they, you know, okay, fine, they're not going to make the Super Bowl this year, but like, what if they're good in the next couple of years? And all of a sudden people are like, actually, commanders endears good feelings. Um, But what, like, what is the viability, likelihood, and intelligence in potentially changing the name again? That's my, that's my favorite downside argument, by the way, of all time. Like, give me a thousand of like, show on the but team what if the they won yeah. the Super Bowl? Then your argument would be foiled. Like, yes, I agree. Sign me up for that. Like, right, sure, right, of right. course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. We, will, we won't change the name because we have a Super Bowl trophy and we save a billion dollars in rebrand. <laughs> You win, yes. Uh, boy, do I look <laughs> foolish here covering a Super Bowl team. Uh, of course, of course. If they, if, you know, if they get really good, the name sticks. Yes, obviously. Um, if, if they don't get really good, uh, that's your opportunity to reboot and reset and, and do it right. And, and that gives you the time to do it not publicly, not in a fake we care about your input, but we actually don't kind of way, but just to quietly do it, get it right, and then spring it on us one day. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, that could be definitely interesting um, because I don't know. It was my understanding that uh, Commanders was a very Dan, uh, a very Dan push, uh, well, it, which it, you know, explains why it, everyone hates it. There, there was no litigation around it, and that was an important factor for that or you know for that group. Which at is that a time. very undan thing. He loves litigation. <laughs> he really just. Mm, mm. 
Give me some litigation. <laughs> Give me some lawyers. The Dan Snyder way. All right. Uh, let's let's go through some personnel here. Um, and I don't want. I'm not trying to do this flippantly because these are people's jobs yeah. and livelihoods that we're talking about. Yeah. But realistically, when it comes to the standard that, uh, based on what we know about Josh Harris as an owner that he sets, the way he thinks about sports, um, and kind of how he's acted in in Philly and to a lesser extent in New Jersey when he took over the Devils. Like, what do you think Ron Rivera's future looks like, short and long term? Well, I, I think it all depends on him. I mean, you talk about got to win. Like, I think Ron maybe has to win a playoff game this year. I don't even think getting to the playoffs is necessarily enough there. I think the other factor tied to that is you get the feeling they're going to want a general manager and, and not not a one guy runs the show operation. And, and so I think the lean would probably be to just fully reset off of that as opposed to, you know, recarving out a new role for Ron. If he wins, he gets to stay. Those are the rules. That's, that's how sports works. Um, you know, We'll see what happens. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible because I don't think it's impossible. I, they, all they needed to do last year, Craig, was beat the Cleveland Browns, and they would have been in the playoffs. And, and you know, if, if they get Minnesota, I think they could have won that game against Minnesota. Like, you've got an alternate history here where he's got a playoff win under his belt at the end of last year by beating the Cleveland Browns. Like, again, we're not talking about, like, solving world hunger here. We're talking about beating the Cleveland Browns. So, yes, it's doable. Um, I think it's more likely than not, though, they, they make a change at the end of the year. And I think part of that would be getting a general manager in place. I think that's really smart and well put um, in terms of the the structure, you know, where he obviously goes after Daryl Morey uh, pretty heavily in in Philly. Uh, and that's after Sam Hinkie, two guys that are very well steeped in the analytics world uh, and kind of more cutting edge thinkers, which is another thing that I, I wonder about with Ron is like Ron is not close minded to analytics and things as uh, proven by the fact that he loves to reference them. I looked at the data. I did this. It's just like, Hey man, well, if you looked at it and this is the result, perhaps you should look at some different numbers and get a little bit more training in that field. But I do wonder like Ron is someone with a vision. Ron is someone who has a philosophy and it's clearly defined um, at this point. And, and I think he, he has a very, you know, dead set sight on what he wants to accomplish and how he thinks he can get there. And he said that he didn't really lay that out when Tepper took over in Carolina and he thinks it cost him. I do wonder what the conversation between Rivera and Harris is like. And if Harris goes like, okay, I see what you're doing. Like, let's do like, do what you think is right. And as long as you're on the right track, it's not going to be about winning a playoff game. It's not going to be a results based thing. It's going to be about looking at, at kind of the results based off the track that you want to be on? Or is that conversation going to happen? And Harris goes, I've been around smart people in sports. You don't, you don't, you don't cut it. And uh, I already know that after this season that, that you're gone pretty much no matter what. Well, he always leaned towards change when it's a new owner. He bought the team. Yeah. And he, you know, he wants his guys doing it his way instead of being told what way to do it. I think that's human nature. You know, any of us take over a project, we want to, want to clean house, do it our way, so to speak. Um, Eric Bieniemy is a really interesting factor in all of this. Um, he's an intense dude, uh, and Ron is an intense dude. A lot of that was masked by the pandemic and the cancer the first couple of years, but Ron is an equally intense dude. Um, you got two really intense dudes coaching that team. Uh, I will be very curious how that plays with the modern player in 2023 this year. I think that's an interesting subplot. Uh, if Bieniemy does great, um, there's going to be a lot of pressure to make him the head coach. Um, the NFL has a problem with getting qualified black candidates into head coaching jobs, and he has become the face of that, whether that is fair or unfair. If he produces quality results this year, there will be a lot of heat league-wide for him to get a head coaching job here or elsewhere. Um, and I think that would be a major domino to fall. If he does poorly this year, uh, the league also honestly is in a situation because when you clean house, he's a guy with no landing spot at that point. You got to find something for him. Uh, but that that's maybe less, less our problem at that point locally in Washington. Right. All right. Uh, Michael Phillips with us, Richmond times dispatch, uh, Two other guys I want to ask you about. We'll go to the, the football one first, uh, and that is Chase Young. How does this move affect the decision on Chase Young, considering Ron Rivera has said, I would like to wait for a new owner to kind of make this call? Well, he's not going to have him officially signed and in place, but if, if Harris you know, ultimately signs the paperwork and, or there's you know, the exclusive deal in place and it's 100% and it's just a matter of a league vote, I'm sure they can, they can find a way to communicate about Chase Young. How do you think this affects Chase in the fifth-year option? 
I took it as a courtesy to the Snyders uh, when Ron said that I, the Snyders and the Chase Young family are friends. They go back. Uh, I think he just didn't want that blood on Snyder's hands, so to speak, of, of ha- having to make him decline the option of somebody who he clearly uh, values his friendship with and the family values their friendship with on, on his way out the door. Uh, I think it negatively impacts Chase Young's fifth-year option. And last one, and this might be the biggest one for the organization. What do you think Jason Wright's future is? You know, I, I think Jason Wright took took some major lumps early on, and it, it was you know criticized for that, and rightly so. I think he has made positive strides recently. I think the the redoing of the club level this year was very successful. I think people who had club level seats felt they got better value, a better experience at FedEx Field. I took that as a positive sign that he's perhaps learning and growing, and and you know moving towards the right path. I just don't see how you don't bring in your own people there because you you, you paid $6 billion for this thing. It, it, honestly, it's nothing personal against Jason Wright. It's nothing personal against Ron Rivera. You paid $6 billion. You got a vision of what you want. You got to go make it happen. Um, could Jason Wright be in a modified role? Sure. I, I think you could move him into a track where he's overseeing the stadium and, and the fan outreach and all that, and you bring in your crew to do new stadium and, and big picture stuff. Um, but anytime there's a change of this magnitude, they're going to want their people doing it their way. That's just an in- inevitability of, of somebody paying $6 billion for something. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning that Jason's background, like what he did at McKenzie was crisis management. Um, and he guided them, not always, you know, some of the stuff like with the Sean Taylor installation or whatever, like there was definitely bumps along the way. But largely, he did a good job of guiding them through a pretty impossible crisis made harder by the fact that the people that he was guiding through it, the Snyders, were the ones that caused the crisis. Um, And I I do think that, you know, Jason deserves some level of credit there. And like, you know, maybe I I think on some level deserves a shot to to see what he can do in the first year or so. And, you know, ultimately, he, you know, Harris is going to want to bring in his own people and that'll happen eventually. But, um, you know, if, if even if he does leave after a year, like people should ultimately look back at Jason as someone who helped them get out of the crisis and get to a point that if, if change that is positive happens quickly, Jason can be to thank for that, for getting some, some infrastructure uh, back in place and some, it's kind of the foundation in place for someone else to build off of. When, when we, Give the final tally of the Ron Rivera era. It will sound very similar to that, Craig. Yes. He, did he win a Super Bowl? No. Was he the best qualified football coach and made the best decisions every week? No. But dang, if he didn't do the world's hardest job with dignity and hold that place together at a time when it had no business being held together. That very well said. Uh, that's why he writes everybody. Michael Phillips, sports <laughs> editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch. Always great to have him here on the Hoffman Show. Thank you, sir. All right, take care. This is the Hoffman Show on the T980 and the Odyssey app.